it's a great pleasure and honor to have today uh, James Binney as our global speaker. Um, I guess all of you, most of you know him. I don't think we need a big introduction. Uh, he's written several books. Of course, the, the, the book on dynamics is uh, known to everybody, uh, Binney Tremain. And uh, I'm sure if you have one with you, maybe you can sign it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, so I, I don't really think I have to introduce um, James, but let, let me just tell a few small things. Um, so in, uh, the, in, he did his doctorate in Oxford in 1975, and then uh, went also to a couple of different places, including also Germany, in, I think, what was it again? In uh, Freiburg, in Breisgau, uh, from 1971 to 32, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Right, right. So uh, he actually speaks a little bit of German. Actually, uh, in our email exchange, at some, some point, came some German sentences back. And uh, well, received uh, prizes and is fellow at uh, what was it again? We have a, a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, a member of the American Astronomical Society, fellow of the Royal Society of London, and fellow of the Institute of Physics. Um, <laughs> yeah, the yeah. system's yeah. gone wild. It's all right. There you go. Okay, so I would say let's not uh, waste more time, and because we're all very much looking forward to your talk, and let's uh, welcome uh, James to the panel. Thank you, Keith. Um, it is a pleasure always to be here. Uh, I spent a, is it too loud? No, it's a bit light. Um, spent a bit of time here over, over the years, and it's always been a pleasure. Uh, but never later than this remarkable, in this remarkable room. Um, so I want to do, I want to talk about the extraction of science from surveys in general. I want to do two things this afternoon. One is to talk about the extraction of science from surveys of our galaxy in general, which I think is a very interesting and extremely current, timely problem to which the community could usefully devote more energy, more people could be working on this, I think. Uh, and then I want to talk about uh, a, a little study that we have just submitted, that the RAID collaboration has just submitted uh, to monthly notices on determining the contribution of dark matter to the force uh, at the sun, which will illustrate some of the points that I want to make generally above and will also uh, indicate that it falls short by some measure of the, um, of the ideal study of this sort. Okay, so just generally, the, this is a, we, are, we are reaching the climax, with a, we're reaching the climax of a, of a whole era of massive surveys of our galaxy. Our galaxy is of enormous interest, as people will be aware, because it is typical of the galaxies which dominate star formation in the current universe. It's a galaxy which is, it, 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 which is characteristic of being the most efficient machine in the universe for turning uh, gas into stars. And we need to understand such a machine if we're to understand, if we cannot understand this machine, uh, we haven't any hope of understanding the growth of structure in a larger way within the universe. So the, the, the Surveys uh, can be usually divided into photometric, well, photometric surveys in a particular class. Uh, a terribly important survey here is the two-mass survey, which was finished almost a decade ago, and is really so a survey of the enormously important study, the survey of uh, the whole sky in the near infrared to find uh, hundreds of millions of stars. Um, and this, this is a picture made up of, of, of um, out of the two-mass catalogue, and what should be noted here is that even in the near infrared, dust is a significant factor. Uh, obscuration by dust is, is, is extremely visible uh, as obscuring the, much of the galactic plane towards the galactic centre. Um, also very important, enormously important, and a lot of work done on this, of course, in Heidelberg, is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, which was effectively finished uh, quite recently. Um, and this is a famous picture of the field of stars that Vasily Balakarov uh, and collaborators made, showing with these structures that the halo, the stellar halo of our galaxy, 
is not a smooth thing at all, but contains all kinds of structure, which is not so very exciting. So the, the Sloan survey is very much looking at very faint stars, much fainter than the two-mass survey, and it's looking in the optical, and it's looking upwards. Um, so it principally studies the stellar halo of the galaxy. Then there are spectroscopic surveys. Um, uh, for spectra of stars, of course, are important because you can get the line of sight velocity to the star. Uh, you can also get indications from the spectrum of what the stellar, what kind of star it is, what the effective temperature and uh, surface gravity of that star is. Um, and you can also, if you've got better quality spectra, determine something about the chemical composition of the star. So a lot of effort has gone into this over the last 15 years or so. Uh, Segway was a follow-on to the Sloan uh, Imaging Survey, and uh, they um, have taken spectra at a resolution of about 2,000 of uh, half a million or so stars. Uh, I've been involved in the RAVE survey, which finished last year, which obtained spectra of a similar number of stars, uh, the brighter stars than were studied by Segway, uh, and at a resolution of 7,500 or so. The Apogee survey, I think, is on the point of being finished. It's done in the near infrared, uh, and it takes spectra uh, at a resolution of 2,000, and there are people here working on that. Uh, the MOST is a big Chinese project uh, to take uh, spectra um, at quite low resolution, but enormous numbers of spectra, maybe uh, well, uh, 10 million or so, I think they're hoping for, but um, there are difficulties with the site. And many people here will be involved in the ESO Gaia survey, which is, uh, uh, which is planning to take about 100,000 spectra of 100,000 fairly faint stars, magnitudes 16 and above, principally um, at a resolution of 20,000 or 40,000, so rather high resolution spectra of around 100,000 stars in the optical. And the Australians are just starting a survey uh, um, on the, uh, what's still called the Anglo-Australian Telescope, although it has no Anglo contribution anymore, um, uh, which is in the optical and is going to take enormous numbers of spectra at a resolution of 20,000 or so um, um, of relatively bright stars, so brighter than the Gaia Research Survey. Uh, okay, so there are these enormous resources, and then to cap it all is the, 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 the sort of high point of this era of surveys is the Gaia, uh, survey which starts almost now, any moment now. Uh, Gaia was launched by the European Space Agency uh, just before Christmas, uh, and it's been in its observing station at the Lagrange Point L2 uh, since, since January. Um, and its main job is to, to, to obtain parallaxes, proper motions, and photometry of all the stars that it can see down to a magnitude limit of about of, of, of about 20 in a very broad optical band and it will, it will measure spectral distributions of all these stars sort of in an objective prism way and it will also take spectra of maybe a tenth of these stars or a twentieth of these stars I think at the moment it's a little bit uncertain what fraction of these stars will get to have uh, low resolution spectra taken so it's going to it's going to um, take the parallax movement of stars which are uh, as far away as the galactic center, which is an amazing engineering feat. It means you have to be able to resolve, have to be able to detect a motion across a 20 cent euro coin uh, from 18,000 kilometers away from the other side of the world. So that's what this machine can do. Uh, and it's a, it's a funny kind of project because the, the satellite has to scan the sky. It takes essentially a one dimensional slices through the sky as it scans. And this, 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 this information is telemetered to the ground. Uh, and then, after you've been over the sky sufficiently comprehensively, some vast computer program uh, crunches the numbers and spits out the positions, uh, proper motions, and parallaxes of these stars. And the first report, so, so there'll be not much uh, useful data, astronomically useful data, until uh, late 2016, and then the computer will spit these out, and some kind of uh, the first really important solution is expected in 2017. Uh, there will be a the, the whole data set might be processed in 2019 because the survey has a five-year nominal lifetime, 
Uh, and then, of course, there will be updates and corrections and so on into the 2020s. Um, and uh, an important feature about this data set is that uh, ESA is simply considers its job done when the computer has spat out the parallaxes, proper motions, uh, uh, and positions of these stars, and we'll just dump them on the web. But these, start, these are going to be just dumped on the web, and anybody will be able to analyze them. Nobody has a proprietary period. So uh, it, you're, if you're interested in using these, everybody should be interested in using these data. But to use these data, you need to have your act together. You need to know what you're going to do with them, how you're going to process them, how you're going to get science out of them uh, ahead of time, because everybody in the world will be able to fall upon them. So, we're talking about huge expenditures. Uh, the Chinese built a new, very special telescope for LAMOS. Um, custom spectrographs were built for Apogee uh, and Gala. The Australian survey each cost about $10 million. Um, the telescope time of the ESO Gaia survey is, is valued by ESO, ESO uh, at, a, uh, at about 60 million euros uh, alone. The Gaia project uh, cost ESA on the order of 650 million euros, and of course, much other money has been spent in universities. So, mankind has spent a lot of money on gathering these data, and we're under a very important obligation to make a good job of analyzing them. So, how so what, so what? So what are we supposed to do with these? What are we trying to do? Uh, as I say, as I said at the beginning, our galaxy is a very typical galaxy. It's very important to understand it, to know, we need to know how does it work. Um, an important part of how does it work as a machine is how is its dark matter distributed, because we believe most of its mass is not in stars but in dark matter, and obviously you need to know how that's distributed in order to be able to address the question of how does it work. How was it put together? Because we believe from Lambda CDM that galaxies were more assembled uh, over a longish period uh, than just arose uh, uh, at once. And uh, the raising question, of course, is how is it evolving? How is it, uh, how is it, how is it moving into new configurations? Models are the key. I'm, this, is, this is my central theme. Models are the key. Dynamical models are the key to achieving these goals using these data. The reason for this is very simple. It's that what you gather in such a survey is, is hugely dominated by uh, uh, selection effects. What goes into the catalogue is what is sufficiently nearby or sufficiently luminous that it can be picked up by the surveying instrument. It is, in, it is extremely non-typical of what's actually out there. And of course, what you want to know is what's out there, not what's in your catalogue. Um, Another very important point is that observational errors uh, are, never, are never negligible for the majority of stars. The majority of objects that appear in a catalog, or the objects in a catalog, uh, tend to cluster near the limiting magnitude of the catalog. And of course, at the limiting magnitude of the catalog, it's sort of almost defined as the place where the observational errors are overwhelming. So that means that observational errors are, are, are a serious issue uh, when you address any survey catalog. You do not want to be taken in by the people who tell you that Gaia will deliver 6D phase-based information for stars. That's not the way to think about it. The Gaia will deliver uh, uh, probability distributions for uh, position, proper motion, parallax, etc. Uh, and you need to work with those probability distributions. Otherwise, you need to, you need to think in terms of the error distribution uh, as, as central to the measurement. For these reasons, it's extremely hard to, to, to go from what's in the catalogue to what's to, 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 to invert the catalogue to infer what the galaxy looks like. That, I think, isn't the way to go. The way to go is to have some models to, to observe the models as the surveys have observed the galaxy and thus construct pseudo-catalogues uh, or some equivalent procedure. Uh, and, then from, and then by comparing these pseudo-catalogues with the actual catalogues, uh, adjust your model until your model uh, catalog looks like your real catalog. Uh, so forward modeling is the way to go. Chemical evolution is very important in this problem, in this, in this discussion about how was the galaxy put together and how has it evolved. Uh, people probably here are very familiar with the main points here. Uh, successive generations of stars have spewed 
We started with hydrogen and helium, and successive generations of starred spewed heavier elements out uh, into the insular medium as they had died, as they had expired. Um, massive stars, stars with masses more than eight solar masses, evolve very quickly and, and come to the end of their lives and spew uh, heavy elements out first. Uh, and lower mass stars, which may, which evolve to white dwarfs and may evolve from the white dwarf phase to a type one air deflagration supernova, uh, uh, get do all this complicated stuff. Uh, over a longer time scale, at least a billion years, that uh, uh, takes at least a billion years or so. Um, so the very first stars that, uh, that were formed are very metal poor, uh, and they're also poor in iron, which perversely is called rich in alpha elements, rich in not iron, so uh, calcium, magnesium, these sorts of elements, these alpha elements. Uh, so these are said to be alpha rich, but they're really iron poor because they didn't benefit. They didn't benefit from the enrichment from the deflagration supernovae, the Type One A supernovae that uh, came online later, maybe a billion years later. So there's a very important correlation between the chemical composition of a star and when we think it was formed. We think those which are uh, uh, alpha rich or iron poor were born relatively early on in the first uh, eighty years or so of the galaxy's life. It's also quite likely, and I think it's the correct working hypothesis, not yet established, but uh, a, a good conjecture to work with, that all the stars, essentially, well, all the stars of the galaxy's disks, which overwhelmingly dominate the luminosity of the galaxy, the, st the galaxy's stellar halo is different, but it has a very small luminosity, essentially unimportant. The galaxy is essentially a bulge uh, and, and, and a thin and a thick disk, and I think it's a good working hypothesis that all of these stars formed in a thin layer in the equatorial plane of the galaxy and have since uh, diffused through phase space to more eccentric and more inclined orbits. And so the, 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 if you look at a population of stars which is not now strongly confined to the equatorial plane of the galaxy, you're probably looking at an old population of stars that's had time to diffuse. And if you're looking at a population that's very strongly confined, to the plane, you're looking at a young population of stars. So again, age now and, and distribution in phase space are tightly correlated in the way that age and chemical composition are tightly complicated. Uh, uh. So it's very important to model the chemical evolution of the galaxy at the same time as you think about its dynamical evolution. It, and, and, the, and the models of the galaxy that I argue should be projected, uh, should be observed in the same way that the real galaxy has been observed in order to interpret the observations need to include chemical evolution on some, on some basis. Yeah, and why do stars diffuse through phase space? Stars diffuse through phase space because the galaxy's potential gravitational field is uh, not a steady thing. Uh, it's mostly a steady axisymmetric thing, but it fluctuates. It fluctuates for a variety of reasons because there are spiral arms, it fluctuates because there are large molecular clouds moving through the disk, it fluctuates because, because uh, the galaxy's the dark matter halo contains lumps of various sorts which sometimes come close to the disk uh, and cause fluctuations in the gravitational field. So the fluctuations in the gravitational field are what cause stars to diffuse through phase space. And uh, in principle, by studying the diffusion of the way stars study by studying the way stars move through phase space, how they have moved through phase space through these chemodynamical models, we can infer the, the extent to which the gravitational field of the galaxy has fluctuated in the past. So that's an important goal of what's going on as well. Um, and in, a, a major problem, uh, well, I think there are two major problems associated with chemodynamical models, uh, chemical evolution models, uh, as things stand. One is that the yield of heavy elements that come out of supernovae is not something I suspect that you can calculate. People used to think you could calculate it, but as, people, as, as supernova models have become more sophisticated and especially have gone three-dimensional, it becomes apparent that, uh, uh, that the process of a star blowing itself apart is a horribly chaotic process, and it's probably not possible to compute a priori uh, what gets sent into the insular medium and what disappears down the black hole 
uh, at the center, or goes into the neutron star or whatever at the center. So I suspect you can't compute, it's just not possible to compute what the yields are ab initio. You have to somehow tease that out of the observations by looking at supernova remnants, and that's all very hard. Uh, and I think it's a problem, perhaps, that hasn't had enough attention. Another major problem I see with chemical evolution models is that, for a variety of reasons, it's apparent that as the galaxy has formed stars, so it has also both accreted a major, a major amount of relatively pristine gas from the intergalactic medium, which even to this day contains most of the baryons, but also that it, is, it has returned a lot of gas to the intergalactic medium. In other words, there is a, there is a vigorous exchange of mass between, the, between disk galaxies like our own and the intergalactic medium. And this exchange of gas uh, obviously plays a major role in chemical <coughs> evolution because we, to, to a large extent, accrete relatively metal poor gas. And when we, when we return gas to the intergalactic medium, uh, it's likely that it's fairly heavily enriched gas that's just been blasted out of a supernova that principally is returned to the intergalactic medium. So that's a major com complication. And we, we are not currently in a position to compute the temporal and radial distribution of this exchange of mass with the intergalactic medium. Uh, and in, in, if we want to be able to compute chemical evolution models ab initio, we, 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 we need to put in some ansatz about this temporal uh, and spatial distribution of accretion. Another major issue associated with this modeling business is the, is the curse of high dimension. The data that we take live in a space of more than 10 dimensions, at least 10 dimensions, because we have the sky coordinates, that's, that's uh, two and a parallax, that makes three uh, dimensions. We have proper motions and line of sight velocities, another three. We have the brightness in at least two bands. I mean, in fact, from Gaia, we'll have a brightness in, in, in which you'd want to quantify it in, in something like eight bands. But let's say two, just to keep the problem simple. You, you have chemical abundances, which as a minimum you want to determine what the iron and the alpha abundances are, so that's at least two, and the people in Australia who are working on the Gala survey are, are interested in, in estimating more like ten chemical abundances. You have surface gravity and effective temperature as a minimum sort of characteristics uh, of a star that you extract from the spectrum. If you add that lot up, it comes to 12 dimensions. So the data living in this 12-dimensional space and the correlation between these commodities, these quantities, these measurables, is what contains the signal out of which we have to back how the galaxy was put together uh, uh, and, and how it is evolving. So if you project the galaxy, if you project this data set onto any of the into, into two-dimensional coordinate planes, which is typically what people do in order to plot histograms. Well, if you plot a histogram, you project it onto a one-dimensional thing, right? If you want to do a contour plot, you project it onto a two-dimensional surface. If you do this kind of thing, you you you're wiping away most of these crucial correlations. You're wiping away your signal. So that we have to we have to get into the mindset of understanding this data somehow in this very high-dimensional space that we can none of us imagine. So that's very bad news. Um, another major issue is that the galaxy is a discrete realization of some underlying probability distribution. We don't uh, exactly, if, if we wait 100 million years, all the stars in the galaxy will have moved somewhere else, all the gas will have moved somewhere else, but the galaxy will still be the same galaxy, even though all the numbers that you would use crudely to describe it are the same. You're not frankly interested in where the individual stars are, where what exactly the density of gas is. You're interested in the underlying probability density function that, that is constant even as the galaxy uh, goes on its annual business of rotation. Um, right, and, and the standard way to go from uh, a discrete realization to a probability density function is to bin the data, right? You just make some cells and you count the number of uh, stars in each cell, and then you, say, and you divide by the volume of the cell, you say the density of stars in here is n over v plus or minus the square root of n over v. Well, uh, if you, uh, when you have, when you're, when you're in, 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 uh, in this high dimensional space, uh, even if you have very coarse spinning on each axis of the space, you have a prodigious number of cells. For example, uh, if we have 
10 bins in each spatial coordinate, uh, which is not a lot, right? It's not exactly a high resolution uh, description of the galaxy spatially. Uh, so that gives us 1,000 bins. And then say we have five in each unit of, of velocity, and we can certainly determine velocity much more accurately than that. So we would definitely want to pin it more, more uh, finely than that. But if we did, that would give us 125 uh, uh, velocity bins at each, at each spatial point. Uh, and then we would want to have at least 10 bins in apparent brightness, uh, because we have uh, there's uh, we wouldn't want to, we wouldn't we have stars of uh, certainly plenty of stars of tenth magnitude and stars of twentieth magnitude, and we wouldn't want to coarsen it by having more than one magnitude going into a single bin. We would want to have uh, uh, say five bins uh, in 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 color because we there's a world of difference between a blue star. And a, and, a, and a very red star in terms of its physical significance. Uh, we, we, we certainly want to have uh, we, at least two chemical characterizations, Fe over H and alpha over H, iron and alpha abundance, and each of those we'd want to divide into low, medium, and high, so three gradations, say. Uh, we would want to at least say that this was a dwarf or a giant, so we'd want to have at least two bins in log G, we would want to say it was either a hot star or a cool star, so we want to say there were at least two bins in T effective, and if you add all that stuff up together, it comes to nearly 2 by 10 to the 8 bins. Okay, so Guy is going to get data from, for a billion stars, uh, but having five stars per bin, and that hopelessly, and that appallingly coarse gr gridding is not at all attractive, right? At five stars per bin, the, the, the density is, the uncertainty in the density is on the order of the density, and we've already compromised our data by binning much more finely, much more coarsely than our errors. So you do not want to bin these data, that's my point. Whatever you do, avoid binning these data. You must also fit the model to the data in the space, the native space of the data, which is a piggy space. What we measure are things like alpha and delta, right ascension, declination, parallax pi, uh, proper motion, line of sight velocity, magnitude in the B-band, uh, and so on and so forth, parent various, apparent various, uh, various magnitudes, etc., etc. These quantities are very far removed from the quantities of real physical interest, that, which, which are things like, what's the position in, in some Cartesian sense, what's the velocity in some Cartesian sense of this star, what's its mass, what's its temperature, what's its chemical composition? All of these Numbers can, in principle, be computed if you know those other things accurately, um, but you don't know those other things accurately. You have Gaussian errors. You can reasonably expect to have Gaussian errors in alpha, delta, pi, and mu because, you, because you've measured them, and measurements are subject to all kinds of accidental variations, and the good Professor Gauss's theorem comes to our rescue to mean that the, to the errors will tend to be Gaussian. But when you... Uh, if, you, if you take Gaussian, probably a Gaussian error distribution uh, uh, in one quantity and you, you use it to predict what the distribution, probable distribution is in some other quantity that's not linearly related, for example, uh, the distance s, which is 1 over the parallax, you end up with a very non-Gaussian error in s, uh, even if you, where you have a Gaussian error in, in parallax pi, and you have... Uh, in V perpendicular, the component of velocity on the plane of the sky, which is a quantity of physical interest, which is the proper motion times the distance, this now, contains, is now uh, uh, contains contributions from the error assumed Gaussian in the proper motion and the horrible non-Gaussian errors in the parallax. So the errors in the various quantities are, are correlated. And so it goes on uh, down the line, that, the, that you, you, have a, you have loads of, because distance is so important and distance is computed in this highly unsatisfactory way of one over parallax, you have, uh, uh, your physical quantities have correlated errors and your physical quantities have very non-Gaussian errors, which makes the error analysis extremely tricky. So the right thing to do is to take the model, uh, fold it through your selection function, that's the probability that a, an object in the model would enter the catalogue because it would be bright enough, near enough, fast enough, whatever, to get into the, into the catalogue, <coughs> um, and, uh, and then add Gaussian errors or whatever, or consider that there would be Gaussian uh, measurement errors 
of the measurable quantities and compare those directly with the quantities that you've measured. You should do this comparison in the space of the data, not in the space of physics. Uh, then I see, then th this is all very well, but I think there are major problems that, that, need, that need to be better understood of uh, how do I conduct this comparison. But the standard thing to do is to do some kind of maximum likelihood. You, you find the model which makes the data most likely, so the model is producing a probability distribution in the space of the observables. You then can calculate the likelihood of the data because you know where they are in the space of observables. And you choose, you adjust the parameters in the model until the likelihood is maximized. So that, give, that tells you what the best model is. It can even tell you what the errors are on those model parameters by Markov chain Monte Carlo. But it doesn't answer the question, the crucial questions, uh, is this model providing an acceptable fit? It's telling you what the best model is of this type, but it isn't telling you whether this is an acceptable model. Uh, and if it isn't an acceptable model, uh, in what way, <coughs> tell me please more, in what way is it deficient? I'm just getting one, I'm just getting uh, some likelihood out. I'm not learning where this bad likelihood come from. And in this, so it, we, we, one needs to understand where this is coming from in this very high dimensional space. And this, I think, requires a great deal uh, of work. And I don't understand really how to do this. <coughs> If we have a model which is a discrete realization rather than a probability density function, I don't know how to do this comparison anyway because I've explained that a discrete realization uh, in this high dimensional space can't be converted into a probability density function not usefully by binning. And since the galaxy can't be converted into a probability density function by binning, it's very hard to know how to compare the two. Another issue is that the interstellar medium is an integral part of this entire enterprise. Um, so, as is probably well known, the probability of an optical photon reaching us from the center of the galaxy is something like e to the minus 30. It's incredibly small. Um, and, even at, uh, and, it, and even at near infrared wavelengths, and Gaia is going to work in the optical, even at near infrared wavelengths, uh, the probability of a photon from the center reaching us is way less than <coughs> one. I'm sorry, it's, it's a small number. Um, so, uh, it's we're in order to go from what's in the Gaia catalog to a statement about what's out there, we're going to have to include obscuration by dust in the models. The present state of our knowledge of obscuration in the medium is lamentable, this, I think, is still reasonably state-of-the-art. Uh, uh, this, this is um, Marshall et al. extracted uh, uh, about, well, less than 10 years ago out of the um, two-mass data. And uh, here we, so here we sit, and these are uh, extinctions as a function of distance, plotted in color, uh, down various lines of sight away from the sun. So this is a sort of sun-centric galaxy, which in my mind is reminiscent of these Jerusalem-centered maps of the world that people had in the Middle Ages. It doesn't bear an adequate representation to what, I mean, they did show the Mediterranean, those maps, but it wasn't, it wasn't really terribly useful. We have to, we have to move fast uh, away from this. We have to model the interstellar medium at the same time as we are modeling the stellar distribution. Um, and uh, Gaia pro it will provide the provides an amazing opportunity to do this because it's going to provide uh, uh, certainly tens, probably hundreds of millions of stars which have trigonometrically determined distances, not spectrophotometrically determined distances, but trigonometrically determined distances. Uh, so that if you if you can determine what the extinction is to those stars, you will know. What the you'll know how much stuff there is uh, between us and that star. These stars will be all over the place. So one has, in principle, uh, the ability to to make a map of the coal, of the dust absorbing medium uh, in three dimensions. And this is something which people uh, are working on. But it's 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 a big, still not clear problem of how do you weave. Uh, this amazing body of information into a coherent 
map of the insular medium, medium in the galaxy, which is a sort of fractal thing. So it has, it has large-scale structure, but it also has very small-scale structure, which is not going to be resolved out even in this amazing data set. But you need, your modeling needs to take account of this in a probabilistic way of the existence of this small-scale structure. OK, so galaxy uh, dynamics. Um, to just remind you of a few basic, uh, basic facts. So start to, to zeroth order, the galaxy is a well, galaxy is a collisionless sort of object. So stars move in the collective gravitational field, and the effects of st individual star star scattering are completely negligible over the lifetime of the galaxy. Um, if you start a, so in a computer uh, a, a collection of objects, of point masses moving under their mutual gravitational field, you find that the fluctuations in the gravitational field decay away in a few dynamical times, um, and then the fluctuations become, do persist, but they, beca but they become relatively small. So we want to work, uh, the, the, the modeling framework should be with, the, with equilibrium models in which you have a collection of objects which uh, uh, are distributed on orbits in such a way that the mass distribution is, is essentially uh, independent of time, as they move in a gravitational field that's ideally made by these particles themselves together with the associated dark matter particles. That's how you want to go. And Jesus theorem tells us the distribution function, the probability distribution of these objects in phase space, um, can assume to be a function of the constants of motion in the gravitational potential of this system. And numerical experiments conducted in the 1960s showed that most orbits uh, in typical galactic potentials uh, have three approximate constants of the motion. So, uh, okay, there is a major exception to this, which is the region of phase space near the end of the bar, uh, and we'll have to address that in good time. We focus on the case, that the, simpli the, the simplifying case, where there are three approximate constants of the motion, uh, and the key point there is that any function of three constants of the motion, since it's a function of constants, is itself constant. So there's infinite choice in what you use for constants of motion uh, when you want to choose three numbers to stick inside uh, a distribution function. But not all constants of the motion are equal. Some constants of the motion are much more equal than others, and these are the actions. They are the, what singles them out is that they're the constants of motion which it's possible to complement uh, with three more canonically conjugate variables, the so-called angle variables, so you have a complete set of six phase-based coordinates, three of which are constants of motion, constants of motion, and three of which evolve in time. And the angle variables, it turns out, evolve in time in a spectacularly simple way, namely they increase linearly with time. So I think it, for me, it's, complete, no, it's completely clear that there is, in practice, no rational choice but to use these actions as your constants of motion, which will be the arguments of your distribution function. And then any non-negative function of the actions provides uh, uh, a possible model for a stellar population that lives in equilibrium, in a steady state, in whatever gravitational field you have, you have hypothesized. Uh, okay, I don't think, I, given the time, I'm going to spend more to do that. Um, but for, so for various reasons, I feel very strongly that we should work with models where the distribution function f, which is the probability density of, uh, of stars in phase space, uh, is a function of these three action integrals rather than the work in the traditional way as f being a function of the energy, the angular momentum around the spin axis, and some uh, not adequately specified third integral. Okay, types of models of galaxy. Well, the dominant models in many ways, uh, and models that played an enormous role in, in orienting of us, giving us a, an imagination of how galaxies formed, are cosmological or n-body models started from cosmological initial conditions. So here are, are a couple of examples uh, from the n-body shot in Seattle. Um, they make very pretty pictures. Uh, the top, of course, is showing the stars, and the bottom is showing the dark matter. 
Um, but they are very computationally costly. Uh, this one here apparently costs 10 to the 5 CPU hours. Um, and they're also unsteerable because the model is specified is by what fluctuations you, you, you put, what non-smoothnesses you put in your initial expanding universe that encodes somehow what, the, what galaxies are going to form out of it. But the mapping between those fluctuations and what the end products is, is not understood. So if you say, I want to reproduce the Milky Way, I want to reduce M31, it's a, a horrendous exercise uh, and not, it's not understood how to do this, how to adjust those initial conditions so that you end up with M31 or the galaxy or, the local, or even the local group. <coughs> Although a lot of work has been done in that area. They're also not as good as they appear to be, right? So, so uh, this looks like, you know, isn't that that's great, they've been able to make a decent spiral galaxy by having the gas turn into stars by some rule and stuff. But actually, what, when, what goes into a simulation like that is not proper physics. Physics has to get suspended at various points because, because the models lack, the computations lack the spatial resolution necessary, and indeed the temporal resolution uh, that goes with the spatial resolution, to, that, uh, that needed in order to understand how stars uh, form, uh, eject surplus matter, and so on and so forth. So, so it's not as if they're a clean, decent, predictive tool because you just, you just fiddle with uh, various violations of physical law until you get what you want. That's not a predictive, that's not a proper predictive. It's not physics as I understand it. Uh, and also, I would, I, I would say there are, two problem, there are two problems in using these kinds of models for serious work. One is that they are discrete realizations of an underlying probability density function. We want the underlying, we need the underlying probability density function in order to calculate the likelihood of the galaxy in this model. Uh, and there isn't any proper way of obtaining the underlying probability density function, as I've explained, because the dimensionality of the space is high. And the other is that the specification of the model is cumbersome and extremely non-unique. If you integrate the model for some more years, for, a, for 10 mega years or something, all the numbers associated with the model will change, but the model will not change. And that reflects the fact that the model is being specified in a highly degenerate way. Most of those, so the model is defined by 10 to the 10 numbers or something, right? Uh, a state-of-the-art model, and most of those numbers are meaningless. So then there are orbit-based models, uh, uh, Schwarzschild, uh, Martin Schwarzschild uh, <laughs> developed a technique where you, you, you say what, uh, what density distribution, and therefore what gravitational potential, phi of x, you, you think the galaxy has, you compute a load of orbits in this potential, and then you assign these orbits weights so that you uh, reproduce the observables of whatever galaxy you're interested in. And there is a, there is a clever adaptation or development of this technique uh, which, inter which, which adaptively adjusts the weights associated with stars as you integrate their equations of motion. Uh, you, don't, you don't integrate the orbit uh, one by one, you, you, you integrate the orbits all together and you, you adapt the weights as you integrate in order that the weighted sum of the of the contributions from the different things uh, agree with the galaxy. So both of these modeling techniques produce discrete realizations rather than probability density functions, so that's, that's bad. They both have highly non-unique model specifications because exactly which orbits you use, uh, uh, you could use a different set of orbits and to describe exactly the same model. And uh, but both of them have the advantage over cosmological simulations that it is relatively straightforward to steer the model, to produce, steer the system, produce a model of a galaxy which you have specific observations, to explain specific observations of, that, you, that you want to, want to do. So these, are, these, these modeling technologies have some importance. In Oxford, we've been working hard, uh, not hard enough, I guess, to produce uh, models of a rather different type that are based on choosing a particular functional form 
for the distribution function as a function of, of the actions. And I want, what I want to uh, uh, show you the results of this technology uh, in a minute. A great strength of this procedure is that it can specify out of this, uh, because we write down what the distribution function is as an analytic function, we can compute, well, it yields us a probability density function. It doesn't yield a discrete realization. It yields a probability density function. So we can calculate likelihoods. <coughs> we have a unique and compact model specification. You just have to specify the values of maybe 10, depending on the sophistication of your model, or 15 parameters of the distribution function, and you've said what the model is. You don't need to specify 10 to the 10 numbers, most of which are redundant. And you can answer the very important question, what would this model look like in a different gravitational potential? It's possible to change the gravitational potential in which the model, in which the stars, in which some, some stellar component sits, and, and, and find out what uh, how that would affect the observations. In, in these other systems, you can't answer that. You can't answer that question. You can just say, well, okay, new potential, start all over again, whole new model. We can we can ask the question of how would my model be changed if the gravitational potential was a bit different from what I what we have at the moment. In order to make these in order to make these models, in order to extract observables from these distribution functions, you need to be able to compute the actions, and I'm, I'm not going to take you through this because I see time is, is seriously threatening, um, but I just want to make the point, I just want to say that there are a variety of ways of computing the relationship between position velocity x and v and actions and angles j and theta. Um, we, we, we're publishing papers regularly on this, there, there we, have a, we have another paper on the that's about to go soon. Uh, and this reflects the fact that we haven't found the perfect way of doing this. We have found ways of doing this. We have working tools. They're not yet satisfactory working tools, but there's plenty of scope for, 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 for refinement in this area. I think this is an important area. Um, uh, and the last word hasn't been written yet, but the thing is, we already have tools which are sort of good enough for the job, though I would like to make other somewhat sharper tools. So our general approach is that we want to construct these equilibrium models f of j that depend on parameters. Uh, we want to find out, we want to infer what the selection functions are of the principal surveys. We then want to fold the distribution functions of our models uh, through the selection functions and, uh, uh, and find what distribution functions best account for the different surveys. Um, and then we want to uh, uh, we want to fit uh, uh, we want also to fit these distribution functions to end body models. I think that's another very important thing because we want to be able to take the ten to the ten numbers of a state of the art end body model and boil it down to an essential number of numbers, fifteen numbers or whatever that describes its distribution function, which I could then that distribution function I could also use to compute a likelihood, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. So let me tell you about the paper we, that, that the RAID collaboration has just submitted uh, um, that assesses the contribution of the dark matter to the mass of our own galaxy. So we, this is based on an analysis. The, the RAID survey has about 400,000 stars with, with stellar parameters and uh, so on. About 200,000 of those are giant stars, and we focused on these giant stars because we see them to a larger volume. These stars have proper motions from the UCAC-4 uh, uh, catalogue, and we have spectrophotometric distances, well, probability distributions, really, uh, and line of sight velocities, good line of sight velocities from the radial velocity experiment, right. Um, so what we do is uh, we, we pick a model mass distribution, uh, rho of R and Z, so an axisymmetric, Act, uh, mass distribution by uh, taking exponential disks for the gas and the stars. So double exponential, two double exponential disks, one for the thin disk, one for the thick disk in stars, and, a, and an almost exponential disk for the gas distribution. We take uh, a flattened axisymmetric bulge, and we take a Navarro-Frank-White dark header. 
Uh, and then we constrain the parameters associated with this mass model of the galaxy um, so that uh, uh, the dark halo is consistent with the constraints that come from uh, lambda CDM simulations. Uh, so that it's the mass of the mass that it has inside 50 kiloparsecs is consistent with uh, the dynamics of satellites, um, uh, as Tommy Wilkinson and Evans some years ago, 10 years or so ago. So that the terminal velocities, so that's the uh, the highest velocity you see in, uh, for example, 21 centimeter emission as a function of longitude from north to 90 degrees is consistent with, so, so the model mass distribution predicts what those terminal velocities are, and we insist that those terminal velocities are consistent with the actual measurements with H1 and carbon monoxide. We assume, we, we insist that the rotation velocity uh, at the sun is consistent with the proper motion of Sagittarius A star, which seems to move across the sky in reflex. So Sagittarius A star is a black hole at the middle of the galaxy, and it appears to move across the sky in reflex of the sun's uh, motion around the galaxy. Uh, and the space velocities of 103 mesars, which uh, Mark Reed's group at CFA um, uh, have found all around the galaxy, and these are sources with sufficiently high sur surface brightness uh, that they, you can do uh, very long baseline interferometry, uh, radio frequencies, and determine trigonometrical parallaxes to these objects, which are comparable to the parallaxes that Guy would, would yield. So these are the, the maser sources are, are associated with massive young stars. They're, they're presumed to move within about 7 kilometers a second of the local circular speed, and these things are seen uh, quite a large number of points in the disk, and the idea is that we have trig parallaxes to these objects, so we know really where they are, we know really how fast they're moving, um, because we have their proper motions and their line of sight velocities, so the velocity field predicted by the, um, uh, by the mass model has to be consistent with that. When we've done all that, the adjustable parameters in the mass model are just three. They're the amount of dark matter at the sun, the density of dark matter at the sun, the scale height of the thin stellar disk, and the scale height of the thick stellar disk. These numbers are still undetermined by all this stuff, which is mostly constrained what happens in the plane of the galaxy. Then we, we use, we, we, we assign the stars of the thin disk and the thick disk uh, distribution functions, which are, these, which are built up out of these quasi-isothermal things, which I won't take you into this. The point about the quasi-isothermal distribution functions is that they're a product of a bit that depends on the radial action, which quantifies how fast the star is moving, how much the star is oscillating in radius, and the angular momentum around the z-axis, <coughs> and the vertical action, jz, that quantifies how much it's moving perpendicular to the plane, and, the, and this, so it's a product like this. The, the radial part is, is basically an exponential in radial action, and this stuff here, this is boring stuff just to stop backward going stars, and this is the surface density of the disk, basically. Uh, and the vertical action, the vertical part of the distribution function, is just an exponential. These are the simplest, the point about these functions are, they are the simplest functions you can write down that are sort of, are, are, are plausibly, could be plausibly uh, associated with the distribution functions of a, of, a, of, a, of a galactic disk. So we write these things down, uh, and there are technical details that I haven't got time to go into. Um, uh, the, the thick disk, which is known, to be, is, known, is known to be very old, we represent by a single quasi-isothermal, and Hans Martin would tell me that that's wrong. Um, the thin disk, uh, we represent as a superposition of quasi-isothermals, one for each age, for each, because the thin disk is made up steadily over the lifetime of the galaxy, uh, with the star formation rate, which we're assuming is exponentially declining in time, uh, uh, parameters that are matched to the Hipparchos work. So we, we assume that each cohort of coeval stars has a quasi-isothermal distribution function, we add all these together and we get a distribution function for the thin disk. So, 
We also have a distribution function for the stellar halo, which is something of a novelty. Uh, if you want to, if you want me to, if you want to ask about that, go ahead and ask about that. But um, I, w I won't go into it now because I'm short of time. So we have quite a, we have a mass model which has three free parameters after we've imposed these constraints. We have uh, a distribution function model which has uh, on the order of ten free parameters. And you have in these circumstances to be a little bit, uh, a little bit savvy, a little bit cunning about how you fit all these parameters in order to get a meaningful solution. So the way we've done it is as follows. Um, uh, we're working with 11 free parameters. Um, for each fixed mass model, uh, we adjust the distribution function parameters so that the, so that the, so that the stellar disk, so, so, that, so that the model is predicting correctly the velocity distributions found by the RAVE survey in eight bins uh, for, so four bins inside the solar radius at different heights above the plane, and four bins outside the solar radius at four heights above the plane. So in each of these bins, we have a velocity histogram for U, a histogram for V, and a histogram for W. The three components of velocity, we have a histogram. And we adjust the parameters in the distribution function until the, uh, until the distribution function is giving these velocity distributions correctly. Um, then we compute the, the, the rate at which this distribution function predicts the density of stars falls as you rise above, as you, as you go away from the galactic plane. So then we compute, uh, oh, sorry, back, no, 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 wait a minute, what's going on? Then we compute uh, uh, this thing here. So that's the density of stars at the solar radius as a function of height. And then we adjust the, the parameters of the, of the mass model. We then adjust the parameters of the mass model until the mass model is requiring the density of stars as a function of height that the distribution function is delivering. Obviously, this is a requirement. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then, so that gives us what we call a self-consistent pair. We have a distribution function and a mass model which are consistent with each other in that they both give you the same uh, density of stars as a function of height above the plane. And then we compare this density of, of stars as a function of height with the density of stars measured by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey by Yurich et al., um, and we uh, adjust the uh, uh, we adjust the local dark matter density until until this quantity computed from our model agrees with the same quantity as observed by Urichita. So this is the this is how it works. Um, here, this is a math model which has. Uh, uh, I've forgotten, I think it's 8 by 10 to the minus 6 for the local, it doesn't matter, some value of 8 for the local dark matter density, 9, 10, 11, 12. So as we increase the local dark matter density, we are decreasing the mass in the disk because the circular speed is what it is. We, that's fixed by the proper motion of Sagittarius A star. So if you have more mass in the dark matter halo, you have to have less mass in the disk. And because you've got less mass in the disk, the gravitational field of the galaxy is pinching towards the equatorial plane less. So as we decrease, as we increase the local dark matter density, the stars, so this is the self this is the density profile of one of our models. Uh, and when we have when we when we have rather a massive disk, as we move up this sequence and have more massive halo and less massive disk, the stars respond by spreading out in the z direction. And when we get to here, at 12 and a half or so in these units uh, for the local dark matter density, the stars are spread out vertically so we agree nicely with Urichita. So we say that's the right model. So this is a chi-squared. So if you, if you compute chi-squared for this process as a function of uh, so chi-squared agreement between the model 
and these uh, SDSS points, you, as a function of local dark matter density, you get this curve here, which, uh, the, well, you get the data points, because this is a discrete exercise, but you can fit a parabola through these points, and that's the dotted thing, uh, and, and, and they tell you that this is you know, the minimum here, this is the right place to be, and from this you can also compute an uncertainty in the dark matter density, which is incredibly small, half a percent. If you do the same exercise using the classic Gilmore and Reed uh, points, you, you get the green thing, the estimates of the density of stars as a function of height. You get the green points, which have a minimum of slightly uh, lower dark matter mass. Um, right. So, so, so that's how we have pinned down the dark matter mass. This is the shows the fit. The the the, the red points are. Um, one lot of SDSS points, these points are another lot of SDSS points, the big curve through here is our model on both sides, and here the dot dash lines show the breakdown of the model into thick disk, thin disk, and stellar halo. Sorry, and dark matter, and dark matter. Okay, um, it works. If you flatten the dark halo, right, so that was for a spherical dark halo, if you flatten the dark halo, you, um, suppose you flatten it at constant mass, then you drive up the local dark matter density, because the density uh, everywhere is going to be proportional to 1 over the axis ratio. Um, uh, and that means that there's more gravity pitching the stars towards the plane. So the stellar disk for a given distribution function, the stellar disk will, get, will, will fall off more steeply as a function of z. So in order to stop that, in order to restore the stellar distribution to the, to the right distribution, you have to cut down on the mass of the disk. So a flatter halo corresponds to a lighter disk. Um, and uh, this, is showing, uh, uh, this is showing the dark matter density uh, at the... Uh, um, at the sun as a function of axis ratio uh, and you can see that the dark matter density goes up and it goes up in such a way that the mass of the dark matter halo is almost independent of its flattening uh, so, so, so uh, as you flatten it you actually have to decrease the local dark matter density slightly but basically you uh, sorry, sorry, sorry you have to decrease the mass slightly as you flatten it at constant mass, the local dark matter density goes up at fixed mass, uh, and in order to get everything, to, you have to reduce the mass of the disk substantially, and you have to, uh, uh, but you have a smaller volume of dark matter halo at higher density, and it ends up. So what this is showing, this curve here shows the mass contained within elliptical radius A as a function of elliptical radius A. For, th for three different flattenings, spherical, 0.8 axis ratio, 0.6 axis ratio, and you can see these three curves are very close to each other. Uh, here you see the circular speed for these models. Of course, that, that agrees automatically, but the contribution from the halo and the contribution from the disk are also fairly independent uh, of, um, uh, of this flattening. Is that Q for mass density? Or for potential? Q is for the mass, not the potential. Yeah. Um, things that do depend on flattening are the surface density as a function of height. Um, so these are the these are the total models, and you can see they do cross at about point uh, at about 0.9 kiloparsecs. The the mass contained within 0.9 kiloparsecs of the plane is pretty much independent of the flattening, but higher up it, there is dependency. But the contributions coming from the disk and coming from the halo are strongly affected by the flattening. So as you increase the flattening, therefore you move from red to green, uh, the contribution going from the halo goes up and the contribution from the disk goes down for the reasons that I've explained. You need to press on. This show. This is just to prove to you that uh, this shows the fits um, 
to the velocity histograms. These are just these are um, these are three fourths of twelve of the twenty four histograms uh, velocity histograms that are involved. The um, uh, the green points uh, are from our model, and the the, the sort of blackish points are the are the rave data. Um, so this is the direction towards the galactic center, roughly, so the azimuthal direction and the vertical direction. Uh, there are technical details there that I won't, we haven't got time to go into. But the point is that we do get very good fits um, to, the, um, to the velocity distributions. The, the bottom line of what we're doing is not very dramatic. I mean, that what we've done is we've shrunk the error bars a great deal uh, by doing this. Um, this is the vertical force as a function of height is that it, and our model is given with a black curve, our uncertainty, which is entirely systematic and, and mostly neglected in other studies, because our statistical uncertainty is like a half a percent. It's just unreal. Um, but the systematic uncertainty, which is dominated uh, by two effects, the main effect is the distance scale to our objects. Are our, are our probability densities in distance reliable? If they're, if they're systematically wrong, we get systematically the wrong answer. So we pencil, and the other effect is, is undisclosed binarity of the stars that we're studying, because we've assumed in the spectrum analysis, of course, that they're single stars. So that gives us we, what we estimate is a 10% uncertainty band. That's the gray thing here. And these points are various other, are various other stars, showing essentially the statistical error, not the systematic error. Uh, and this... Uh, we have, well, is, is, is by comparison with Bodie and Riggs, who is a rather similar approach, but in many ways a very different approach, uh, breaking, the, uh, uh, breaking the SDSS stars into monoabundance populations. Okay, I think it's time, well time that I stopped. Here are my conclusions. Um, dynamical models are absolutely crucial for exploiting these major observational e efforts to survey our galaxy. Models that have analytic distribution functions, depending on the actions, are extremely useful. So when we've used them, in, slightly as a worked example, to uh, analyze half of the RAVE, the giant half of the RAVE survey, uh, to determine what the mass distribution is, the gravitating mass distribution is in the neighborhood of the sun. Uh, here are some numbers that the surface density uh, within 0.9 kiloparsecs of the plane is 69 plus or minus 10 solar masses, where that plus or minus is systematic error. Um, the mass of the dark matter inside R0 is one of our, is, is a number that's independent of the flattening. Well, and actually that sigma 0 is independent of the flattening pretty much too. Uh, uh, and we, we got that as 6 plus or minus 0.9 times 10 to the 10 solar masses. Uh, the density, local density of dark matter is quite strongly dependent on the flattening, and there's, and there's a value. The baryons in this model contribute a bit less than 46%. Well, for a spherical halo, they contribute 46% of the radial force on the sun. For a flattened halo, they contribute less than 46% of the radial force on the sun. And we, I, I'm pretty sure we can get stronger constraints out of this data set by fitting the data in the native space, which is what I told you we should be doing, and you will have noticed it's not what we have done. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very nice talk, and I'm sure there are questions. So, uh, can you tell us if you have any strong constraints with you? The axis ratio. Yeah. No. Well, we, I mean, it's ex I've told you, yeah, that's my point I was making. I, but, but I've said at the beginning, this is not what you should be doing, and that's my final conclusion. So we projected the data into one dimension, and then we've got to bin it, because if you, if you project it into one dimension, you can bin it. Right? Binning, in this sense, is completely okay. We have so many stars, it's neither here nor there. What, our sin was not binning, our sin was projecting. And I think we have lost significant signal in doing that. This is not what we should be doing. <laughs>
Well, one thing we should do is uh, we shouldn't assign distances to these stars at all. We should be fitting in the space of the, of the counts, the number of stars, the magnitude counts. Um, another thing we certainly could do is we could do uh, a likelihood calculation. I mean, the model is producing, the model gives us a probability distribution in, in phase space, and we can, we can compute the likelihood of the model. But these things are computationally expensive, and uh, my concern here was, was to get some numbers, some important numbers out of the data in finite time. Is it exactly on this topic? Uh, yeah. Do you have a thing? Yeah. Uh, sorry. I mean, is this the reason why you said at the, at the beginning that your uh, tool entails some tools which are not, uh, which are good, but not perfect? I mean, is that related to? No, that, I, that was that was. I think I was talking then about the com computation of the actions. I said that okay, we have tools so that are not perfect, and we have used for this purpose a tool which is good but not perfect. But I think totally adequate for this purpose. I have no anxieties about it for this purpose. There are purposes for which it's it's not quite sharp enough. No, the problems here. The problem here is the difficulty of doing this sort of maximum likelihood calculation with a large data set. We tried doing that before Christmas. And it kind of ground in, well, it, it, it turned out that we couldn't do it by that approach. Poisson noise was creeping in and it was killing us. So, um, yeah. So I know what I want to do, uh, and I know that I can't do what I want to do. Um, this is, and it's partly a computational effort, it's partly a matter of that what you want to do is computationally very expensive, but it's also partly. Uh, I think an understanding issue of how you do this fitting. You know, what's the right when you're in this big space, you can't afford to um, just stumble around at random, right? Do a drunk walk. You have to know what you're doing. And so I spent a little time trying to explain the order in which we pin things down, and it turned out that was very important. And there are good. And after the event, I can tell you physically why that works. There's one of your results is that pretty much half the mass in cycle. Solar radius is dark matter. Yeah. I somehow thought you had argued in the past that you less of it had to be dark matter because microlensing results do not allow for that much. Or are the two things <coughs> I think it. I mean, certainly I've been a, a supporter of maximum disks and, and the dark matter, and sorry, the microlensing data is part of the story. I think this model is consistent with, the, what, but the trouble is it doesn't bear sufficiently strongly on that question because the microlensing constrains the amount of, of dark matter that's inside, say, inside the bulge, right, say three kiloparsecs. And here we're making measurements out at eight kiloparsecs. To go from here to there, we have to do an extrapolation, which we do, of course, using our, using our uh, exponential disk scale lengths and stuff. Now, disks are not exponential. As Agaris Kalnais, uh, and there's a famous occasion in IEU 100, which nobody here probably was at, of myself. Uh, so I can, uh, but there was this gasp of breath when he showed uh, that all of Rubin et al.'s galaxies, you still read that Rubin et al. showed that galaxies had dark matter halos. Well, well Agaris Kalnais was able to show that if you just took the photometry of her galaxies, and you put it through standard machinery in order to predict the, the, the um, gravitational potential with none of this dark matter nonsense, you've got beautiful fits to the data. And you do because they're not exponential. But it's not part of your small error bar because you have faith that only the radial profiles from NFW have to describe things between the middle and the outside and you normalize it at one point. Yeah. No, no, I mean, all these, these are all, this is all perfectly true. That if you if you would change the functional forms that we assume to extrapolate inwards, you would change all these numbers. And you would add <coughs> some structure, say spiral arms, would then be <laughs> these numbers? There are, I think probably not. Um, there because we're our signal is coming from fairly well off the disk. Um, and I, I doubt if there's, if, 
it's the person. So there are hints, there are papers even on, uh, um, indications uh, that spiral structure is generating, is, is, is causing velocity perturbations of a few kilometers a second in of, you know, like two, three kilometers a second in these data. Um, and I think such fluctuations would not change the bottom line. But I think it would be wise uh, to, I mean, that is where you want to go. Here you have a model which is a going concern. It's a viable model. It's definitely not unique. Uh, you, it's, it's written in angle action coordinates, which means that it's tributed. Those are the language, those, are, those were invented <laughs> to do, uh, Jacobi and, and company, to do perturbation theory of the solar system. They are what you need to do perturbation theory for the galaxy. This is the next thing to do. A next, or many next things, but it's a next thing to do. Say it again, please. Sorry. Shout. You're, you're, you're thinking of these histograms. Yeah, but you see that distribution function is the red line. Yeah, the, the red line is what the distribution function predicts at the middle of the cell. This is a technicality I didn't want to go into. It's what it predicts at the middle of the cell when you don't take account, well, the middle of the cell, with no distance errors. So that there are significant distance errors. And when you 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 figure out what the distance errors are doing, they move this point to this point. So stars which are on the wings, so the distance errors tend to populate the wings of the velocity distribution. The stars you see there are not really moving, mostly not really moving as fast as they appear to move. They're stars closer in that, that have got a bad distance and consequently their proper motions uh, have, have so so, so it's, it's, it's not a failure of the model that the red line doesn't go through. It's completely constructed so that it doesn't, because you, that's, our, that's our allowance for distance errors. OK, so I would say let's stop here. And uh, let's thank uh, Jim again. <laughs>